Hi and welcome. My name is Lila Allen and I'm the editor of AD Pro. I'm here with four experts in organization, product, and interior design to discuss a theme I think resonates with all of us, especially right now, which is mindful living in a modern world. 2022 has just started and leading many designers, interiors, enthusiasts, and yes, even us editors to think a lot about the ideas that will define the next year in design. Along with concepts like comfort and warm minimalism, mindfulness is one resolution that feels like it has real staying power right now. But what exactly is mindfulness, especially in the world of interior design? How are designers thinking about it as they craft spaces for clients whose homes are increasingly fluid, active, and multi-use? How does mindfulness figure into considerations like materials, sustainability, transitional spaces, flow, biophilia, and other elements? Today's panel of experts should have plenty of insights for us. Um, so I am very pleased to present uh, Bridget Romanic, who joins us from Los Angeles, and 8100 honoree, Bridget, or, excuse me, Bridget is the founder and principal designer of Romanic Design Studio. Bridget's adept eye for color, form, and texture has earned her an A-list clientele that includes both Beyonce and Madonna, and has even garnered her inclusion in the book By Design, the world's best contemporary interior designers, published last year by Fiden. Next, we have Jake Arnold, also out of Los Angeles. Jake is the founder and principal designer of Studio Jake Arnold, a firm he formed two years ago. Jake is one of our newest inductees to the AD100 and is the co-founder of The Expert, a digital platform that connects high-profile designers with clients via online consultations. Jake has worked with a roster of celebrity clients that include John Legend and Chrissy Teigen, Katy Perry, and Aaron Paul, just to name a few. Representing a different but extremely important part to making an interior sing, we have organization expert Laura Catano, founder of Organizational Design, who is based in Brooklyn, New York. Laura has shared her expertise with the likes of the New York Times, Elle, Real Simple, and New York Magazine, among others, tackling everything from closets to kitchens and all of the messy drawers in between. With more than 16 years in professional organizing and styling, I'm hoping she'll have some key insights for us today. And finally, I'd love to welcome Sebastian Brower, VP of Product Design and Development at Crate and Barrel, who are the generous sponsors of today's event. In his position, Brower has led in-house design and product development teams to create and curate product experiences and brand collaborations alike. Thanks so much to all four of you for being here and joining us today. And I'm really excited to jump in. Um, before we get started, a quick note to our audience that um, we will be ha having a conversation with the designers and then hopefully turning to some questions pre-submitted by you all. So know that that's ahead. Well, to start, I think we should just take a lay of the land and look at the word mindfulness itself. The word can have different meanings to different people. Um, so before we go into kind of the nitty gritty of the design details, I'd love to know how our panelists understand the term. Sebastian, let's start with you. Welcome. Uh, how did mindfulness come up in Crate and Barrel's collections for this upcoming spring? And how did you understand the term internally? Was sustainability a part of that? Or how were you all thinking about it? Um, hi, Lila. Uh, first, thank you so much to you and um, the entire AD Pro team for bringing us all together. Um, I've long admired the work of Bridget and Jake and Laura. It's incredibly unique, relevant, and powerful. So I'm delighted and humbled to be here um, for a super fun conversation. Um, mindfulness, I mean, such a powerful wor wor word, not only because it's January and I think we're all seeking for a fresh start, but also because of the context of what we've lived over the past two years. Um, and to us at Crate, um, mindfulness really is about prioritizing people and planet. Um, we see ourselves as a lifestyle brand that touches the whole home, um, whether it's beautiful and functional kitchen tools to your favorite comfortable sofa. Um, we believe that the environments uh, that touch you, that are around you, um, have a direct impact to your mental health, to your well-being, um, and we take that really seriously. And sustainability is obviously an integral piece of that. Um, we don't see sustainability uh, as a choice. We see it as a responsibility and our purpose, and we take it incredibly seriously. Um, and the great thing about today is that you don't have to sacrifice beauty or aesthetic 
um, to make the right choice. Um, and all of our new collections are um, sustainable, whether it's solid European oak or bleached pine. Um, they're all FSC certified, which means that they're sustainably sourced and come from um, responsible sources down to um, your textiles and your bedding and the, and the product that touches your body. We use non-toxic materials and dyes. We use only organic cotton. Um, we've centered a, role of, a lot of our development around uh, fibers that are renewable and sustainable and consume very little water. Um, and we also believe in a, in a strong edit. We believe in buying less and buying better, bringing pieces into your home that are intentional and serve a purpose. Um, and we wanna you know, offer quality and value. And um, that's really how we see mindfulness. It's really at the center of everything we do. And we take a very human centric approach when it comes to developing product and deciding what to introduce into our lines um, and let our customers bring it into their homes. So mindfulness is curation and product development too. It, it's great to see products from you all hitting the market that are so attractive and sustainable. And, um, you know, it's just as a consumer, so wonderful to see more and more coming to market that we can also feel good about. Um, Bridget, I would love to turn to you for a moment. What does mindfulness mean to you and your clients? And is it something that you kind of unpack together in the discovery phase of a project? Or how do you think about it? Really, the word itself, mindfulness, really just sort of stops me in my tracks each and every time because it sort of centers me and brings me back to where I really have to think and be conscious about everything that I'm doing with each and every client um, each time. And, you know, my clients kind of, you know, they can see it differently that what that word means to them could be different and um and it takes on different forms, but it's always, the end result is always that the client wants to feel heard, wants to feel um, enhanced by what we're doing. And, um, and so it's really, really important each time to really learn to, to speak the science of what that means with each client and really get in there and, um, and elevate and enhance what's important, important to them. And so that's how I see mindfulness. And it's also expressing and sharing um, things that I've learned in, in our field that uh, allows them to do even, you know, what they want, but it may be a, an elevated version of that. So it's taking in everything and, and seeing how we can do it and make it better for our clients. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm loving these projects that we're seeing kind of going through the background, lots of greenery, lots of natural light too. Um, yeah. I know for me, those things can make a big difference too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Laura, you bring a different perspective to the conversation here, I think as a professional organizer, though obviously your skill set goes beyond that. Um, but what does mindfulness mean in your world? Oh, Laura, I think you are on mute. Um, can you hear me now? No, I sure can. Uh, the joy of the internet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> mindfulness to me is with intention. Um, you know, my approach to organizing is based on lifestyle. Um, my goal is to help my clients change the way they see things, because if you can change the way you see things, not only in your life, but how you take them into your life, um, you can be much more intentional and mindful of the things that you can bring into your life. Um, you know, the truth is I'm, I want people to see things the way I see things, not my values, not my taste. Uh, not everyone wants to live in an all white apartment. Um, mm -hmm. But it's about, listen, I studied environmental science. I'm a self-informed shopaholic. I had to change the way I saw things. I had to be much more mindful about how I was living, who I am, what's important to me, and how I took things into my life. It was, uh, you know, a necessity. So that's what I'm trying to teach my clients. Look at everything as a tool. The only reason stuff exists is to help you do something. So mm -hmm. if you want to set up a space, if you want to organize, if you want to just live, you have to know what you want to do. If you can do that, if you can figure out how you want to live, what's important to you and how you want to set up your space, then you can create a home that you absolutely love and be incredibly intentional about how you set it up based on how you live and only take things into your life that add to your life in a meaningful way. 
so really assessing function and how it kind of intersects with the lifestyle or, or the life that you're hoping to live, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you don't set an intention for how you want to live, then how are you, how are you right. going to make that life happen? You know? And intention setting, you know, even outside of design is like such a big part of the conversation of mindfulness. If you go to a yoga class, you think about it, an intention going in. So, you know, right. why not bring that into design and the way that we set up our lives? Absolutely. Um, Jake, is mindfulness a term that comes up in conversations with your clients? And if so, what does it mean to them and to you? And yeah, I, I would love to just hear from you about that for a moment. Yeah, sure. I think mindfulness definitely comes up a lot. I think a lot of people that I work with are in the entertainment business. So a huge part of their life is being so public and then having to create a space at home where they're very deliberate and mindful with how they're actually going to use certain spaces. And I find a lot of clients are liking to marry like the sustainability element with the mindfulness because I think mm -hmm. they're kind of hand in hand. And people really want to bring these kind of ideas together that when they come home, they're very deliberate with time. And same way with homeowners that I speak with on the expert platform, we're trying to be mindful with people's time when it comes to the design process, because I think we spend a lot of our time really thinking about the programming and how clients are going to use their space without actually having lived in the home. So it's very important during the process especially when you're working on ground up construction where a house maybe doesn't exist and a client hasn't experienced their home in that way. It's an integral part of um, the, the process. And also we have fun with it because I think it's interesting to see how certain clients, how they de define mindfulness to them and, and how that can differ from myself or other people on my team. So it's, it's definitely integral for sure. So it, it sort of relates to something that Sebastian was saying a moment ago about the relationship between mindfulness and sustainability. It sounds like those two things are very much related in your world as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, it sounds like through all of this, like communication is a big part of it. It sounds like everybody on this call maybe has a little bit of a therapist as a part of their job, um, you know, <laughs> sitting down with the client and really kind of mining some of this stuff out. Um, <laughs> So great. Well, I, so now that we've discussed the term mindfulness itself and kind of understood what it means to our, our speakers today, um, I'd love to get into some of the more kind of like details of the home and some of the trends that we're seeing right now in that space. Um, you know, we at AD Pro have been hearing a lot about the shift towards multifunctional spaces. I think it's something that we're all living with right now, um, you know, especially in this moment when many of us are re-entering quarantine. Um, <laughs> but uh, Bridget, going yeah. to you for a moment, um, given that everything the home is performing, uh, for all the roles it's performing for us these days, mm -hmm. what do you consider to be kind of the heart of the home these days? I, I think it, it's really, it's still, the kitchen is still really important. And I think it always, always will be. And I, I absolutely love that because that is a place where you're going to, everyone's going to cross everybody and mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, there's some sort of conversation, even if it's just, excuse me, as I need, <laughs> yeah, I sort of need to get by. And so I think the kitchen will always um, be a part of the, of this conversation. And I also the living room. Mm -hmm. The living room has really become a spot. And what's happened to all of us is that sp sp spaces have to be multifunctional because you don't want to necessarily stay in your four walls, um, in your room. And so you kind of go out and you are really living in your house. And I think that is a really valuable um, a really valuable thing to happen because you see how you use the spaces, how you want to use the spaces. And then what I'm finding is that not necessarily, everyone doesn't necessarily have a, a family room or a den or anything like that, but, you know, most of us have a living room. So that's become a space where you feel like you've sort of stepped out into a different area. And then another family member steps out into that area and it makes it forces all types of things, conversations, <laughs> um, you know, it forces, um, you to really think about how you want to live, live in that space. So I would say the living room has become a big part 
of the conversation and to detail it was before maybe like I just it's a living room we want it to be cool but it's a living room maybe can we put a little game table over there mm -hmm. or maybe can we have uh, multiple seating areas or um, floor lamps or you know because I'd like to read and so it's you know the vocabulary and the understanding of what that space is has been um, sort of more important than ever with my clients. So. We've, we've been hearing a lot about gaming, actually. Lots of game yeah. tables have popped up in recent projects, and yeah. it's mm -hmm. something we've been talking about a lot as a trend. So it's, you know, the revival of, of tabletop gaming, I think, has been happening kind of alongside the pandemic. So yeah, um, it's a great example of layering in an extra function in that kind of space. Yeah, finding ways to really enjoy your home, like to really, to really live in it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Jake, turning to you for a moment. How are you feeling about the open plan layout in this day and age? I know it's been a big debate over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on one hand, you have competing Zoom calls and remote school still. Um, but on the other hand, we're also seeing a shift towards kind of fluidity in the home. So, so what are your thoughts on it? So I think definitely, with the, but even before the time where, that we have been in in the last two years, I think it's so important that you always have that central space because ultimately, whether you have a studio apartment or a 10 bedroom house, everyone always ends up, mm -hmm. like Bridget said, in the kitchen, family room and a pantry getting yeah. snacks. That's all they're doing. So <laughs> I really think it's always going to be integral that those common areas with the everyday family space, especially with kid, like kids and, and families, I find a lot of our clients love to have a slight more open plan everyday room if they have the luxury of having a smaller space. Mm -hmm. But I would say that a lot of the projects we've been working on in the last couple of years, we've really been coming up with solutions for spaces that might have been used for um, an additional like playroom. And now we're changing into like maybe a library or an office or a space that allow someone to close off the room. I think especially in a lot of contemporary homes, mm -hmm. typically they don't allow for that, for that separation. So we're trying to find, we've been finding creative solutions with using things such as screens um, and many other ways to allow for flexibility because not everyone has um, the privilege of having so many different rooms to, to choose from. So really being creative with how we can kind of create a, a sofa into a guest room that can be a pullout and also an office that can turn into a dining room afterwards. So I think having flexibility is key, but still, I think forever people are really going to want to have that kitchen family room space just for everyday living, because I think that's where all the conversations start from and is really, I think design ultimately is, it dictates the way that people interact with one another. So not having it feel too separate, but I think the key here is like flexibility. Um, I'm sure this is top of mind for people like Sebastian. I'm sure this is figured into how you all are conceiving the lines at Crate and Barrel these days. Um, and, and Sebastian, I just want to ask you, you know, um, design is a, a sort of way for us to materialize our stories. Um, at this point, travel is still very much curtailed for many of us, um, and we're continuing to lean into our homes for both creative inspiration and uh, emotional well-being, going back to the idea of mindfulness. So, so how is Crate and Barrel taking this into consideration in, in terms of materials or, or other design elements? Yeah, um, good question. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, us designers really believe in the energy of spaces. I think it's one of the main reasons why we do what we do. We have kind of this esoteric side of us that <laughs> believe in flow and energy and in the power of color and in the power of imagery and spaces to transport us. Um, and when we're conceiving this, this spring line that we, we just launched um, and having, you know, spend most of our time at home, we wanted to provide a beautiful escape, you know, we, we are as aware of the body as we are of the mind and there's nothing healthier for the mind than to have a, a space to think, a space to kind of clear your head. Um, and um, we had two particularly particular strong influence for the season, which were the Mediterranean, which are mm -hmm. seeing some images flash right now that were very intentional sort of locations that we picked for inspiration because of the warmth that they have, that beautiful neutral and neutral texture. Um, the sense of endless, you know, horizons and ocean views, optimism, 
Um, and also the, the, the play that you see in the Mediterranean of blending beautiful natural materials and sustainability, as I mentioned earlier, being such a strong anchor of what we're doing, we also want the beauty of those natural materials to really shine through. So um, some of the images that you see, which are layering warm white textures and, um, and materials, were intentional in the sense that we wanted to come off the holidays, which are always a pretty hectic period, and this sense of being sort of isolated and, and traveling inwards to the sense of expansiveness and openness and beautiful neutrals that would just inspire our consumers to see their home and their spaces in new ways. And while we can travel as freely as we wish to or were used to in the past, you can bring those little pieces home. And we manufacture a lot of our, of our pieces in Italy and in Portugal. And there was an authentic connection to that inspiration as well. And some of the images that you'll see later uh, had an anchor around Indonesia and Bali because we saw it as a great vehicle to layer darker, richer textures and organic materials and that earthiness that we were all seeking. And we also manufacture a lot of beautiful product in Indonesia. So it just felt right and inspiring. And, and we all need an escape, right? And it, it can come through, through what we bring into our homes. And, you know, comfort too. I mean, I'm looking at these and, and it looks very inviting and I feel like comfort is something that we're all seeking so much right now. Um, Laura, to go back to the conversation about layout we were having a moment ago, um, what are some of your recommendations for setting up a home for an easy flow, to use uh, Sebastian's word, and kind of a natural sense of organization? Sorry, I had to mute myself because I have construction going on in the background. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to make a list of all the activities that you want your space to support. Um, and you also want to make a list of all the things that go along with it because it's really important to store things where you use them. Everyone knows the toilet paper goes in the bathroom, right? And the pots go near the stove. But with other things, I think people get confused. It's like if you're exercising in one area, your exercise equipment should be there. Um, you know. Everything should be about the experience of what you're doing. It should be graceful, intuitive, and easy. But you also have to keep in mind that things take up the space they take up. And, you know, like Jake was saying, not everyone has the benefit of having an extra room in their house where they can make an exercise room. Um, so if that's the case, you need to be really intentional about the things that you're bringing into your life. Like if you do want a treadmill, don't get the biggest one they sell or get one that actually can fold up and go under the bed or behind the sofa when not in use. Um, you know, I buy travel sizes of everything, my hair dryer, steamer, and iron, because I don't want to bring something into my life that's actually helpful that I'm going to use, but now creates a problem. Like, where am I going to store this? You know, is, is, is having this treadmill or whatever, you know, this widget, whatever it is, going to get in the way of me living the way I want to live every day. Um, you know, living within the means of your space is really important when you're thinking about how you want to set up the space and the activities that you want it to support. I mean, um, knowing that not everything you own needs to be accessible 100% of the time, I think really can help a person out when they're trying to set up their space and know that like, you know, if I have to reach for something because I'm using it once a week, it's not the biggest deal in the world, um, especially if it's going to help keep your home looking and feeling the way you want it to feel on, uh, you know, the 99% of the time you're actually using it. So again, it sounds like it's going back to this idea of setting an intention and then kind of working from that point, right? Yeah. I mean, everything that you know, I always tell my clients, I think so hard before I take anything new into my life. I mean, it is a, it is a process. Um, and some of my clients are like, I don't have time to think about everything. I'm like, right. Because you think about everything you own every day, right? Most people deal with their things. I use and put my things back because I'm so incredibly intentional about even the pen that I have. It is the pen that I love. I found it. I got rid of all my other pens. It's the only pen that I ever used. It's the only pen in my home. Don't try to give me a free pen. But it is important if you <laughs> incredibly intentional 
about I hate free pens. I, 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 <laughs> so what I will not show that, you my what pen What happens if that pen becomes your famous. new favorite? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jake, that, that's very good. But I will say uh, the free pen that you get from whatever, probably not going to be your next favorite pen. <laughs> also, I also need to take a leaf out of your book because when I, I buy stuff on Amazon and fill my counter one day I'm like I'm gonna cook now and I buy a rice cooker a toaster Wait, oven, and I'm like a you're gonna cook I, Jakey <laughs> I, have, I have a tip for you okay and this and I know this when I say these things people think I'm nuts but because like I wanted a Vitamix for years right but I told myself you're not buying a Vitamix and I I did mention I'm a shopaholic, right? So I need very specific goals <laughs> for myself to buy. I'm allowed to buy anything I want, but it has to change my life. But if it's like something like a Vitamix or rice cooker, Jake, do this. You have to be in the situation where you're actually going to use a rice cooker to buy it. Does that make sense? Because you, anyone could be sitting around being like, I want a rice cooker. No, 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 it makes sense, but Wait. I think this once count. I think if you have the, I had the intention to cook, but it doesn't mean I'm going to be <laughs> consistent. <laughs> you in the kitchen, hungry, about to cook, saying, you know, it would be really good if I had a rice cooker right now. Or were you thinking like, oh, I really want to cook and we're all stuck home. I don't want to, you know, that's right. good you point. Be in the situation where you're actually going to use it five times and be like, damn, I've got a rice cooker right now. But usually you're not going to be in that situation five times. So then I paid you from buying a rice cooker. You did, even though I bought it last week. But I was going to say, <laughs> what's the return policy? Yeah. <laughs> and we made it a rice cooker. Right 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 I have a theory about that though, but we can talk about that at the yeah, end. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother conversation. But <laughs> I think that's a really good advice because we all love to shop and buy things. Mm -hmm. So be more mindful about what you bring into your house. It's great. Yeah, yeah. totally. Well, Sebastian, turning back to you for a moment, what are some spaces in the home that you feel have uh, renewed or growing interest these days? Um. Well, I love what Bridget was saying earlier about, you know, in her client's home, the focus on the living room and the kitchen. You know, I think in the last, every decade, we see the home change, right? And it's connected to disruptions or lifestyle changes. But since the pandemic, we've obviously seen a lot of those changes sort of accelerate. And there's renewed interest in parts of the home that formerly were not as important, right? Um, I mean, such as the home office, you know, we went into um, isolation and lockdown rather quickly. And very, you know, immediately the day after I started to see my team working from their dining room table or from their kitchen island, right? So multifunctional spaces, you know, really started to evolve. Um, we also talk a lot about the great room at Green and Barrel. We, we call it the great room because we see this open plan layout emerging more and more in customers' homes where the kitchen is so integrated to the living spaces and as I mentioned, human-centric design is about building an environment that puts you at the center. So we see a lot of the open kitchen emerge. So people caring more a lot of a lot more about their plates and their utensils and their tools as beautiful objects that are on display, right? Down to the color of the Dutch oven that they buy, that is often displayed on their stovetop that's on their beautiful kitchen island overlooking the living room, right? So the great room is something that we definitely have seen being the center of a lot of evolution and behavior. And we see a direct relationship to how our product assortment evolves and what people are craving. Same with the home office, you know, it, it's evolved into becoming a much more considered space in your home that is not longer just about organizing what you work with, but also about creating a space that allows you to be your best self and come up with your best ideas. So making your home office feel as comfortable as your living room, not just functional and as beautiful as your living room is important. We've obviously seen a shift into, you know, formerly the formal living room was the place where that was more public. And then your private life was a little bit more separate. We now see an integration of both public and private spaces into one because you spend most of your life in it. So we've really seen kind of the dead, the slow death of, sofas that feel too formal or too petite or sofas that are meant to be you know displayed in a way that are not meant to be to live in um mm -hmm. and i also care a lot about entryways and hallways you know we forget about the places 
and the spaces that take us to our main spaces. So you'll see some imagery of entryways that are filled to the brim with candlelight, you know, and or or more intimate spaces that you can turn into special places for yourself through small touches, you know. I I I, I don't like to forget about those spaces that are more for you. Um, so yeah, that's a little and pantry, you know, organization, pantry modularity, the home gym. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of uptick and in interest into spaces that get a lot of life out of them. Mm -hmm. And your point about kind of the accessories being on display, like the pots being on display, I think that kind of underlines what Laura was saying about picking the right things and things that you're going to love and that you're happy to have out your, you know, even if you are storing them away when they're out, you're happy about them. They're working right for you. I think this all is, is holding together really well. Um, Bridget, we've talked about home gyms, we've talked about tabletop gaming, we've talked about rice cookers um, and cooking at <laughs> home. Are there any new behaviors that you believe are really here for the long haul and not just kind of a temporary byproduct of the way that we're, we're living in this moment? Absolutely. I, I thought that plants were probably going to be, you know, a, a phase, but what I'm, I think as people are living with them, they're finding great joy. And um, I always, always, always include greenery in my interiors because I think not only are they, they they're good for you, um, but they make you feel good. They're good for your mind, your soul, your health. And there's this sense of, of you know, bringing nature into your home and into your life. And that gives you that, that for me, that fuels me. Um, it allows me to exhale. It allows me to um, feel like I'm escaping when I'm just a room away from my kids, you know, having fun or doing whatever it is they're doing. And so I wanted my clients to experience that. So I've, I started doing some kind of unusual things and saying, let's bring in a tree. And at first it was like, what did she just say? Did she just say, you know, bring in a tree? And it became, yeah, let's bring in a tree, you know. And um, by example, in my own living room, I, I started, you know, bringing in trees and people would come in and it was really funny because the look was kind of like, oh, you know, because <laughs> I have to have nice things and I had an atrium from the moment I moved in and I just filled it with plants. I just knew immediately I wanted a space that I could completely let go and exhale. And I, and I do want my clients to experience the same thing. And so sometimes it's been these long kind of conversations. I'm not good with greenery. I, you know, I can't take care of a plant, but what they eventually find is that when you find the right plants for the space and um, it, they really enhance your life and it gives you time to sort of let go a little bit. And they'll start telling me about plants that they've brought in and how the watering is therapeutic and the taking care of the, the plants feels really great. And so it's this, you know, I did think it was a, a sort of a phase, but it's turned into um, a way of life and including um, such, um, you know, such a mindful, if you will, of such mm -hmm. a mindful thing into, into um, client homes. It's just beneficial in so, so, so many ways. Um, I did have one client who said the dog loves that they have a tree, but uh, <laughs> for the wrong reasons. But other than that, other than that <laughs> Be uh, mindful of the of your pet situation, maybe. Yeah, I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> thanks, mom. Uh, but but um, really, I just feel like it's just such an integral part. Now, I call my atrium kind of my my Sunday morning room. Mm -hmm. I'm in it a lot, but it just I go in there and I'm looking at uh, you know books and doing research and working, and I feel enhanced and fueled by it. And I, I have had the conversation many times with clients, you'll feel the same watch, and then they, 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 do. Mm -hmm. they really do. So that's been great. And I also think, you know, there are materials that we kind of thought the cozy materials and fabrics that we thought might have been of a moment, but are really having staying power, which I think is great, because, you know, the feel of certain things and, um, you know, I call what I do livable lux. And the idea behind that is that, you know, everything is uh, functional because design is meant 100% to have a function and support you. But it, it really does make you feel better. Like what, what's the sign above that room? What do you want that room to say when you go into it? You want it to feel cozy. So let's support that. You know, you want it to feel, uh, you want to feel invigorated. Let's support that. But it's just, all of these things are part of the conversations and clients are informed and have the conversation with us. And it's really a great exchange. And 
you know, the end result is mindfulness and plants are definitely a part of that and, and uh, fabrics and materials. I love those rooms, Bridget. Who wouldn't want to be there amongst all that Very gorgeous oh, greenery? Come over, please. I, want, <laughs> I want them so badly. And your use of color is just so energetic. And I, there, yeah. there was that one image where you had all those plants. And I'm like, why can't, couldn't that be someone's home office? Thank you, you so who, much. Wouldn't, who wouldn't want to work there all day? Yeah. All and it really, friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It does feel really good. And it's, you know, it's a little bit to the left. It's a little unusual in, in the best way possible. And I often bring clients to my home to sort of show them this is what I'm talking about. And I haven't had one objection. And if anything, um, it's sort of grown and grown and grown. And I'm really happy for, for everyone for that reason. It makes you feel good. And we all need that. Well, it's kind of nice to be able to nurture something, I think, right Absolutely. now, too, and see it Absolutely. grow and, and have some control over it, yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> so I think your point about it having a kind of therapeutic quality is, is right on the money, too. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, um, going back to kind of the idea of, like, accumulating stuff, uh, which sounds like, you know, you deal with a lot in your work, how do you balance the need or the desire for more stuff, um, especially when we're in you know living at home so much we are investing more in fitness equipment we're investing more in hobby related materials rice cookers uh and work related <laughs> items <laughs> how do you balance that with with also maintaining a clean and, and clutter free home well the key is um looking at storage as open versus closed and most people when i come into their home um you know they're overwhelmed by their stuff because all of their all of their storage is open. Like in this slide here, um, this client is moved from a huge house to this tiny studio, and she's like, "Oh, I'm gonna have a TV. I, I picked out this TV stand," and I'm like, "No, no, 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 no! You don't want an open TV stand. Let's use this chest of drawers so we can store a ton of stuff in that." So this is an, an example of closed storage drawers, a cabinet. Um, you know, the other thing is editing. You know, uh, it's like Sebastian said, like every 10 years, you know, homes go through this change. And for personally, I tell my clients every seven years, it's a good time to do a major edit, not just spring cleaning, but like a major edit. Um, this slide just quickly, this is an example of how would you can have a ton of things, but if you set them up in an intentional way, it can look beautiful. And this was very intentional. This was 16 hours of my life that I'm never going to get back, but I think it was worth it. <laughs> Totally. These are organized. These are organized by topic. So anyone says that, oh, you just color coded it. No, it's, this is organized. This is a, this is her resource uh, library. This is an interior designer. Um, but editing out, you know, editing out what isn't adding to your life to make room for what does. Um, you know, I, I use this term freelancers for things, you know, Things that you, okay, you have a specific project, you're doing something, you want to cook rice, you buy a rice cooker, and it's working for you in a very specific short amount of time. But then people keep that thing, even though the need for it is gone, and they might not have that need for a few more years. Um, if something is cheap and readily available, get rid of it. If it's not adding to your life, it's not, it's directly taking away from it. So get rid of the freelancers, okay? If you need something in three years again, buy it in three years or borrow it from a friend because keeping it is gonna inhibit you from living the way you wanna live now. Um, you know, the other thing I do, because uh, sometimes it's not a matter of editing, you know, sometimes it's a matter of shuffling, you know, like moving things around, like playing the tile game. Um, do you guys know that game, the tile game? Because I use this and no one knows what I'm talking about, so I really gotta get a different uh, analogy. <laughs> Um, let's put it this way. It's, it's a puzzle, right? Um, most people have the puzzle pieces, but they just open the box and dumped it on the table, right? It's a mess because nothing's in the right spot. But if you start moving things around and putting them in the right spot, the beautiful picture emerges. Um, if they, if you do truly need more storage, then I look for the sweet spots. The sweet spots are the places in your home where you can seamlessly add storage and no one will think, oh, oh, why is this big cabinet here? Or, oh, you, you're living in a storage unit. Um, because the truth is, I am not looking to fill the space with as much stuff as we possibly can. I am not the organizer who is maximizing every inch. Um, because the truth is, 
most people can get rid of like 30% of what they own and not only be happier, be way happier. They'd be, they'd be much happier. Um, but yeah, if you could find those sweet spots in your home where you can seamlessly add a little, uh, a drawer unit, um, I don't know, a closed nightstand, people, Crate and Barrel, you should only be making closed nightstands because <laughs> everyone, I, 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 if I have to look at a, at a nail clipper or a tube of lotion in someone else's home, <laughs> I'm gonna, like, I shouldn't say anything because, you know. I agree, except in the guest room. I actually like guest rooms to have non-storage nightstands because then my guests leave so many things behind. <laughs> and also with guests, when, when, when my clients are, they, oh, I, I want to have room for guests. My next question is how, how long do you want them to stay? Yeah, you have to make it as uncomfortable as possible. It's literally yes. a mattress with I an have, open nightstand. Yeah, I have clients who are like, I don't want any guests. And I'm like, well, First of all, then don't invite them over to your house. There's these things called hotels. Second of all, they're like, okay, one night. So yes, make it a little more uncomfortable. I have clients who their parents come in and they stay with them for a month. So they're like, no, and then we need to make it very comfortable and intentional. Again, the intentional, the mindfulness of what do you actually want to do? How do you want to do it? So then let's, let's set it up to give you the result that you actually want. No one's staying here, by the way. <laughs> like... <laughs> Well, Jake, I know we've been teasing you about your rice cooker. I'm sorry. You've been a very good sport. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's be my rice cooker as soon as I get home, it's going in the trash. <laughs> no, it'll be my rice it. cooker soon. I'll yeah. take <laughs> um, But I wanted to ask you, you know, what's a space that you've designed recently that you feel supported a client's need to live more mindfully and, and meaningfully? Sure. So recently we just completed a 1920s um, Spanish revival for Williams mm -hmm. House. And what was really interesting about that house is, of course, originally back in the day, like the way that the spaces were set up of the kitchen was more of a back of house space. The living room was very formal. And then there weren't so many additional spaces that um, the couple who had children, they couldn't get away from. So when we designed the space, it was so important to open up, I think you can see in this image, the living room to the kitchen. And we expanded the kitchen and both of those rooms actually lead to an outside covered area. And it was really important that they had this indoor outdoor relationship so that when it came to, obviously we're very fortunate, the weather is 90% of the time good enough to sit outside. It allowed for that separation when everyone was in the house for us to actually put a TV outside in this covered space that created an additional living area that maybe the kids or the grown-ups could sit there and actually have their own time and away from the kids. But also we created this amazing library, which was a dead space that we kind of uncovered between mm. the living room and the entryway. There was like an additional space in the entry, close this up. And then we had this amazing opportunity to have a room where they can have drinks, invite guests over, maybe take a Zoom call. And it was really important for us to introduce these different spaces by bringing in back to, I think Bridget mentioned with the textiles and the fabrics and being very cognizant and deliberate with those materials. And also something to bear in mind with regards to being mindful and making your house feel a reflection of yourself, but also support your needs. A lot of clients even have certain allergies or materials that don't make them feel good so so a lot of the furniture that we made whether it was custom or purchased was really looking at the fill of some of these materials because now that everyone is at home and using their space all the time and not just sitting on a sofa for a brief minute that comfort and the practicality of maybe the fill or the textile or the texture where someone might have used a velvet sofa in their main living room is maybe going into a more natural linen or a wool um, or cotton so that it's very comfortable and easy. And, and in this project, it was so important that we did bring a lot of textures and warmth and, and rich, deep colors that evoked a more um, relaxed mood setting that I think is so important when anyone's at their home that you really walk in the door and like Sebastian said it's not the rooms but really the entryway and the passages to getting there is gives you enough of that transition period from the outside world 
to really going into your spaces to switch off. Um, and in this project, we had a lot of hallways and corridors and stairwells and really to make sure that we introduced interesting carpets. Lighting is a huge thing, I think, with mindfulness and setting that mood um, from a work environment to a relaxed environment. So you can really have a, a space that's multi-use where adding a dimmer is a life changer and one day it's work in progress and then the next you're relaxing on the sofa. So, so important to bring in the texture, the lighting and also the indoor outdoor um, elements I think is key. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talking about bringing the TV outside. Obviously, outdoor spaces continue to be a huge part of, of design right now, and we see kind of interior elements moving outdoors. But um, to Bridget's point earlier, you also have the outdoors kind of moving in. Um, and it, it just seems like it's really um, just adding so much. And, and mission accomplished with this house, by the way. It's just beautiful. The textures and the Thank you. colors are just beautiful. So dreamy, Jake. So dreamy. Thank you. I know it was very sad to leave. Like, don't you find that like, when you design a house, you don't want to leave? You're like, oh, oh it's terrible. It's either. like a breakup. I know. So, it's yeah. terrible. It's, it's so terrible. sad. But I'm, I actually get to go back to this one on Saturday. I'm very excited. Hopefully yeah. it's still standing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, Laura, we are approaching the spring, um, which means one thing, of course, which is decluttering. Where do you start? Uh, when you're working with a client and how do you evaluate what to keep and what to toss? Oh, you're on mute again. Sorry, the construction, I keep putting myself no, on it's mute. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you always start with how do you want to live? What's mm -hmm. important to you? Um, and then from there, you just do the easiest thing. It, it, the truth is it doesn't matter where you start. Um, really, you just want to do the easiest thing. Everybody has that bag like like Jake's rice cooker. He knows he was getting rid of it. But I never should have brought this rice cooker up. It's going to be like haunt me. <laughs> he knows he's getting rid of it. Get it out. Everyone has that bag of donations. They're ready to let go, but they're like, oh, I'm, I, I just want to, I want to wait to do one big run. That's not the way to do it. You Just get it out. Everybody has an inventory of everything they own and they take it with them everywhere they go. Think about that for a second. Isn't that depressing? Um, so what you want to do is you want to get out the low hanging fruit, things you absolutely know you can get rid of and get them completely out at the end of the day. Um, one thing, there's no thinking in editing. There's no, like, there's no like, okay, we have these three things. Okay. This you're definitely going to keep this. You're definitely going to get rid of, but this one, oh, when did I, how much did I say, honey, do you, remember? no, that's no. Eh. That's not the way to do it. You do the thinking beforehand. When you're editing, you do this. Definitely keeping this, definitely getting rid of this. This, uh, I don't know, but you know what? It belongs in the kitchen. So I'm gonna put it in the kitchen and then move on to something else. It's not when in doubt, throw it out. It's not, uh, you know, if you haven't used it in six months, get rid of it. It's worst advice. It's like, it's worse than the pens, you know, in my mind. Um, you know, forget about that. I'm a shopaholic, by the way. So. The whole, not only like get rid of it if you haven't used it in six months, but do you love it? Do you use it? I'm a shopaholic. I love everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, does this add to your life? And also forget about the, if you use it every day or if you have, I don't care. The, you, the past means nothing. The past should mean, the past means nothing to me. It should mean nothing to you. So I don't care if you used it all the time or you haven't used it. The thing you haven't used could be your next favorite thing. And sometimes the thing you're using or wearing every day, maybe you should stop doing that. You know, maybe it's time to look at the can opener that you have that you use all the time, but you actually don't like it. It's actually uncomfortable. It's not, you know, go to Crate and Barrel and get a nice ergonomic one, you know, and something that looks beautiful. When you take it out, you actually enjoy using. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how does this add to my life? That's the question. Not do you love it, do you use it? Um, you know, the other thing to me, because my goal is to, like, I help my clients change the way they use their things, the way they see their things, so they stop bringing in the bad stuff, right? Because I want to break the cycle of consuming and purging, consuming and purging. That's what everyone does. I don't actually use the word clutter, and I don't use the word purge. Mm. Purge, to me, is like vomiting. 
that's what I think of when you're purging. Oh, you vomited? You know, because purging is like a fast, violent, involuntary action. Oh, I purged. I just get rid of everything. And, and they're like, they just, I got rid of so much stuff. And it's like, okay, what did you learn from what you got rid of? Oh, well, I wasn't using it. Okay, mm -hmm. why weren't you using it? If you don't learn, if you have no intention behind what you're keeping and what you're getting rid of, and there's no mindful connection to that, how are you going to stop it from coming back in? If you're getting rid of all your turtlenecks because you don't like turtlenecks, but you don't actually say I don't like turtlenecks, and it looks amazing on you, Sebastian. So it's not about you. You know. Oh, I'm not getting rid of any turtlenecks. <laughs> <laughs> you, look, you look really good in a turtleneck. That's all <laughs> but it's like if you don't learn from what you're getting rid of, you will forever be in a cycle of consuming and purging because that's what we all do. We all just do the same thing over and over again. Once I finally realized I can't, I don't like turtlenecks, I get really hot and I feel really restricted, I just kept buying them. Yeah. Right? Well, Jake, Jake, for you, I mean, do you feel the tide is turning back towards minimalism or, you know, what does that look like? And how does that kind of tie in with maybe recent lifestyle shifts? I think it's a really good question because I do feel that minimalism has like a different meaning than it did pre-2020. I think definitely with regards to editing the amount of things that you have is definitely on the horizon and I think here to stay based and I agree with Laura it's it's really about really streamlining everything that you have in your house but when it comes to design and I think uh, the set the design sensibility of minimalism as being more cold and restrained I think it it's more now I think about creating areas and spaces that feel layered comfortable and inviting this living room that we did in Connecticut was a very is, is actually furnished relatively minimally there's not too many pieces but everything that was put in the space was very deliberate and and with the intent of it being an inviting warm space with the introduction of mohairs, really amazing textures that are inviting. And I think the color palette has a lot to do with um, allowing minimally furnished spaces still feel inviting. But I would definitely say that the stark cold use of a space is, is diminishing, especially as a primary residence for people. I think we all can agree that we want to walk into our space and it really feel layered and comfortable and, and and same with this dining room. I mean, really in this room, there's a dining table and chairs, but we commissioned an amazing mural on all the walls and automatically really brought the space in and made and, and allow people to entertain and have amazing conversations with people that are bringing to the house. And sometimes I think less is more with regards to too many things to allow that kind of communication and, and relationship building, especially in a dining space, that you're not distracted by so many things. You can really focus and empower and motivate your friends or your loved ones that are around you to almost like live better by, by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget, in a lot of these images today, we've been seeing lots of kind of organic shapes. We've been talking about natural materials. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like organicism, like rounded forms are sort of having a moment right now? And, and if they're trending, you know, how do you balance um, trending designs with kind of existing pieces that people love? I, I absolutely love that it's happening because I think that it brings a, a sense of relaxed, uh, in a relaxed environment, in a coziness. And as long as you have these organic shapes, um, opposite pieces that are harmonious with it, then it's great. And, and, and excuse the designer speak here, but as long as they're having a great conversation, you know, all the pieces, then that's absolutely fine. And I also believe that, like Jake said, and like Laura said, we're, the idea that less is more is really great because you allow each place where one's eye lands to be a statement, but it's all, you know, cohesive and together and, um, and help make the room just really, really beautiful. You don't have to have stuff upon stuff upon stuff upon stuff. That's not what it is. You know, I really like to, um, you know, bring in the big pieces and then really take a step back and look and, and, you know, dot and fill in, but it's not a case of just throwing everything at a space and seeing, you know, what works, what doesn't, let's place the pieces here, here, here. Um, the goal now for all of us is really to have a place to, you know, relax and feel more, um, 
more at ease, more um, just more centered and more um, cozy, bottom line, cozy. And so like organic shapes and great pieces, it, it, they really, they do that. They, they do that for you. Um, classics, new pieces that give you that sense of really everything. I, I have to say, I really, yeah. I, yeah, I it seems like, like coziness and comfort are, are themes that have come up several times today. It seems yeah. really important in this moment. Yes. Rooms have to perform. They, they really do. They can't just be, you know, it's not the case of there's a rope and you can look over in the room. You want to actually use that room. And so it's important how the sofa, what the sofa pitch is. And it's important that the materials, like Jake said, you know, are really usable and comfortable and make you feel um you know, enhance. These things are really important. Yes, it's beautiful, but it functions beautifully as well. That's really... I think that's true because it makes it more memorable. Like people remember yeah. how they felt in the space yeah. versus right. what it looked like. So uh -huh. when it's really uh -huh. comfortable, you're like, oh my God, watching a movie or mm -hmm. hanging out at so-and-so's house is more yeah. appealing to people. Every time. Yeah, people always remember how they felt. It's not always a case of, I remember she had this one piece that really got me, you know, it's, it's, it's more that it's overall about how mm. that space made me feel. I mean, looking at this space, I just want to go in that room with those, <laughs> with those curtains in that bed. I just want to like, just go in there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and we'll take Jake's rice cooker and we'll go there. We'll hang out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sebastian, how are you uh, understanding kind of this new sort of minimalism? What are its characteristics? It's, you know, what colors, textures are, are you um, seeing kind of resonate with the movement? Um, I personally love minimalism. I, I connect to everything that Jake and Bridget said. You know, I grew up in the 90s and I remember when it started in fashion with Jill Sander and Calvin Klein and then interiors followed suit, but they were the interiors were rather stark and cold and the materiality wasn't as warm. So I think I love minimalism even more now because of what it's becoming. And some of the interiors that Jake showed, which he labeled as minimalist and Bridget's grand, beautiful living room, I see that as modern minimalist because there's more layering, there's more textures. You know, it's the cozy fabrics that Bridget mentioned earlier, but it's also that sense of expansiveness. I see minimalism being more artisanal and textured today. So that image that you see there, for instance, you know, we wanted to highlight the natural beauty of the materials and let that shine through. Um, it's, it's expansive and edited and spare and with intention, but it's not austere and cold. It has this warmth that comes from the environment and the pieces that are in there. And also bringing in nature in intentional ways like Bridget displayed to me is a new way of looking at minimalism where you're bringing in the natural world versus bringing in more objects um and it's less synthetic you know the minimalist movements of the past i think people had an obsession with plastic because it was new mm -hmm. minimalism today i think we're gravitating towards the natural and the imperfect and the touched by hand you know for instance those vases they're very minimalist in how they're conceived super beautiful sort of almost aegean minoan greek mediterranean forms but they're not stark or sharp they're beautifully plastered and textured and same, same to that wall, you know, clean lines and, you know, a little bit more than what would have been considered minimalism before, but there's warmth and texture and motion and it's dynamic. I actually love that product. It's actually individual pieces of art that you can tile and create mm. this feeling of a textural wall. It's one of my cool. favorite, favorite new things that we're introducing that I'm actually excited to see how designers use them and hopefully use them because you can turn them into art. All right. Cool. Um, and do, do cool stuff with it. So yeah, I would characterize it as warm, as comfortable, as layered. Um, and I just love it. I hope it's here to stay and, and has staying power because it's how I like to live. <laughs> do you feel like it supports kind of mindful living and, and this new mindfulness we've been discussing today? Oh, for sure. And talk about color. I also love this image. It's, it's an art from a photographer I love. Um, Minimalism can have more color and the way that you use color can be more intentional, intentional, right? So when color is in a room and, and it strikes the right chord, um, it gives you super good energy and feelings. And like Bridget said, when you go into an amazing room, you don't think about what chair was there or what art or what chandelier, you think about how you felt. Mm -hmm. um, and that's so, so important. Well, I, I feel like this conversation has gone uh, wonderfully. It's been uh, really great speaking with all of you today. Um, there are certainly some takeaways I think we can make about 
setting intention, um, you know, buying intentionally, you know, it sounds like, again, comfort and the way that uh, rooms can make us feel is just very central in this moment. Um, so at this point, I'd love to just transition quickly to an audience question or two. We don't have much time, um, but I do want to make sure that we address at least a couple of these. So if you don't mind, um, I'll direct this one first to you, Bridget. Um, what materials and color tones do you think are here to stay? You know, neutrals. Neutrals are just, it, it's, they're palatable for most all of us. And I think there's a sense of calm that happens when you walk into a room that is, that has these neutral colors and tones. And also I think muted colors, you know, so if you don't want to necessarily live with creams and tans, or you might find it a little bit too stark for you, even though there are like a thousand different um, shades of white, so you can you can address that that issue. You can live with the, you know, muted blues and um, pale pinks, and you know there are lots of colors that you can uh, incorporate that give you that cozy and that calm and that serenity, um, but also have a little, you know, have a little spark to them or a little bit of energy. So. I think neutrals are here. I, I know for sure neutrals are here to stay. And that comes in so many, it's, it's not just the creams and tans. It could be darker colors. It just really depends on how you're putting your color story together. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of soft tones and, and really good stuff that one can use. Those are not going anywhere. And I'm thankful because um, I love walking into, I love color, absolutely love color, but I opt I also love walking into a space that just makes me go, ah. <laughs> just sort of fall and you know get my get my blanket and um, right and just relax. And so, in terms of fabrics, oh my gosh, you know, boucles are definitely staying, alpaca staying, uh, mohair. Um, there are all these fabrics that really lend themselves to a warm, um, a warm kind of uh, environment in the best way possible. Just super luxe, but like just you know, again, cozy. Jake, do you agree with, with uh, Bridget's thoughts? You bet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to. Uh, <laughs> take notes, take notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, I, d I mean, I definitely agree. I mean, I definitely am a fan of neutrals, of course, but I also am leaning into more color because I do think that, like Sebastian said as well, if you're very, if you're very, specific with the types of color that you're using you can do it in a minimal way that doesn't feel overpowering and i think that i do see people leaning into having a little more confidence into choosing more color and i think bridget to bridget's point with going in the more muted palette i think definitely is a little more timeless and allows people to evolve and grow in the space and i think that's what's key is that yes every seven years we're throwing things out but do we want to fully renovate an entire house every seven years probably not mm -hmm. but i think when it comes to paint and fabric choices the textures the boucles the alpacas i think it's really interesting to see how popular those are even in cities and and areas in the world that actually have a warmer climate so it's it's even i think that coziness transcends regardless of where you live but also at the same time i think that what's timeless is something that again back to the feeling that just makes you feel good because I think if you design based on what it looks like and I'm all about high impact spaces that are really livable so I think that two the two are mutually exclusive and yeah I think definitely mirror a lot of the same outlook with Bridget and I think but also have fun with it I think even though you're using it every day bring in that some pillows or a throw or an ottoman or something that can be easily changed out that maybe is in a color or a fabric or a stripe or a print that you might not necessarily have used before and it gives you that flexibility which I'm all about. Well Sebastian what design innovation are you most excited about for home and how will it impact people living in their homes? I've seen a lot of incredible innovation in fabric to Bridget and Jake's point, where I'm seeing a lot of upcycled uh, fabric being used in the supply chain that excites me a lot, um, such as upholstery fabric that is incredibly soft and tactile that's made, made from recycled ocean plastic. So I'm seeing a lot of um, beautiful, environmentally friendly 
uh, material innovation happening, um, both for indoor and outdoor, you know, upholstery needs. Um, I think engineering has also made a lot of incredible advancements and now you can develop product that is incredibly modular uh, without sacrificing quality. So now we are going after uh, developing sort of modular storage units that have this feeling of being a beautiful custom built in. And that's something that before, you know, connections or joinery, you know, wasn't really there in order for you to, to do beautiful, customizable storage landscapes in, in, in people's homes without having that feeling of Ikea or repetition. So those are two things that I'm pretty excited about that I've seen recently. And also non-toxic dyes for color, you know, so we're, we're doing a lot in um, developing textiles and fabric that achieves beautiful color, but that it's done through um, natural dyes and non-toxic processes that also save a lot of water. So those are just some of the things I've seen that I'm pretty excited about that I think will take a central stage in the next three to five years. Yeah, I'm excited to see kind of what else comes out in the next few years. I feel like so much has happened just in the last five years or so. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you so much to you for, for being so generous with your insights and your time today. And thanks to all of you who have tuned in. And finally, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Crate and Barrel for making this event possible. Um, it's always a pleasure working with you and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.